So uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'll go ahead and kick it off. Uh, I'm Commander Matt Myers. I'm the Foreign Area Officer Community Manager. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Caballero, for your help in uh, getting this set up. And thanks, everybody, for your time today, joining us for this little lecture of opportunity. I uh, really wish I could be there in person. Uh, I was. I did have the opportunity to stop by and, and about a year and a half ago during the Naval Strategy Forum, uh, right before they, they canceled it about halfway through uh, the event, but I was uh, still there on the ground. So uh, looking forward to them resuming that uh, activity. Um, all right, so we're here to talk about the Navy FAO community and what um, what that is, uh, and what what we do to contribute to our um, to our naval objectives and how we how we fit in with the rest of the fleet. Um, and so, uh, but before I get into that, I'll just give you a little bit of introduction of myself. So I am a foreign area officer myself, and like all of us, we come from somewhere else. We all lateral transfer into the FAO community from uh, another community. So I started out uh, as an aviator. Uh, I went to college at uh, Oregon State University, did ROTC there, uh, and then I uh, selected for aviation. So I went into the uh, the helicopter pipeline there, did my uh, fleet, my JO tour out at uh, HC8, transitioned to HSC28, transitioning from Frog to uh, 60 Sierras. Um, and then uh, for my short tour, I did the Olmstead Scholar Program, uh, not related to the FAO community. You're probably familiar to it. Uh, typically, URLs uh, will do that, but uh, it did it did result in getting me the the training that set me up for success as a as a FAO. Uh, so I got uh, Korean language training at the DLI in Monterey, and then uh, over to Seoul, where I attended Yonsei University. Got my master's degree in uh, international relations there. Uh, then back to the fleet, did my dissociated sea tour on the USS George H W Bush as an air ops guy. Um, and then, uh, then uh, selected for operational department head, uh, went out to HSC-12 uh, in Japan, did my department head tour out there, part of CAG-5. That was, uh, that was great. So it was kind of at the end of my department head tour there where I was ready to, finally ready to uh, take the step into the FAO community. I considered it at several points along the way, but I wasn't quite ready to give up uh, flying and, and operational, um, being a, a pilot and, and, and being an aviator, just wasn't quite ready to say goodbye to that. But finally, upon completion of the department head tour, I said, okay, it's time, lateral transfer to FAO. So pretty pretty late trans career transition. Very few people will change designators. That late in their career, I was a uh, very senior lieutenant commander, um, but I did it, was accepted. Uh, it kind of worked for me because I had done Olmstead and, and, and had all the training stuff that I think if I hadn't had that under my belt already, it would have been pretty tough to make that uh, successful of a career transition, but uh, but everybody's uh, path's a little bit different. So since I joined the FAO community, I went uh, went back to Korea, attended the Korean War College. Uh, they are kind of the equivalent to what you all are doing at uh, there in uh, Newport, uh, and then over to Seventh Fleet Staff, uh, where I did my uh, my FAO milestone tour as the uh, in the N5 as the, as the deputy director there. And so that's a that uh, Seventh Fleet staff is a great, great place to be a FAO because uh, it's very, it's very um, in touch with what we're doing operationally, and but also still able to inform um, what what we're doing out there and ensure that's uh, tied to our strategy objective. So that's uh, that's me now. I'm here in Millington uh, as the officer community manager. Very much eager and looking forward to getting back overseas, which is where a FAO really belongs. Um, so before uh, we go into the rest of it, I will turn it over to my co-presenter, Lieutenant Commander Lindsey Fats. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I came to FAO a little bit differently. I was an intelligence officer uh, before I was a foreign area officer. I uh, commissioned via officer candidate school and then did intel school at Damnak for six months before going out to Whidbey Island where I was stationed with uh, VQ1 for a couple of years, did a few debts uh, around the world with them and then went to the Naval Postgraduate School to get my degree, my master's degree in uh, Middle East Regional Security Studies as an intelligence officer. Um, from there, went to the Joint Intel Operations Center in Hawaii for four years, focusing on South Asia. Um, spent a lot of time um, both studying and uh, traveling in South Asia. I had the opportunity to do a 
uh, debt with Sockpack in Kathmandu at the embassy there, worked with the Nepal army on disaster risk reduction for seven months. And, um, and so got just a lot of experience working with a partner nation, working in an embassy and realized that I just love the work. Um, so when I got back to Hawaii, I applied via the LAT transfer board and was accepted um, as a Middle East VAO. And from there went to DLI. I learned Arabic at DLI in Monterey and then did a tour at NABSAN in Bahrain. I was the uh, country engagement officer for Egypt and Jordan uh, and then moved over to the Bahrain desk officer uh, job. From there, I was selected to come here to Millington and I'm the junior detailer for our uh, 03 and 04 foreign area officers. All right, okay. So that's us, uh, Matt Myers, Lindsay Fab. Here we go. Okay, so um, I'm sure you all are in deep on 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 all of this stuff there in your in your curriculum. So I won't I won't belabor it, but I think it's worthy to point out that the the first line of the national defense strategy uh, is that they is that the NDS acknowledges an increasingly complex global security environment characterized by overt challenges to the free and open international order and the reemergence of long term strategic competition between nations. Uh, which, of course, goes on to discuss uh, great power competition. Uh, there, as you know, there are three distinct lines of effort, effort uh, in the national defense strategy, rebuilding military readiness, reforming DOD business practices. But where we, uh, where, where we get most involved is strengthening alliances as we attract new partners. And you, we see this theme over and over again uh, in strategy document after strategy document. So as I'm sure you're aware, Tri Service Maritime Strategy just uh, published in December. Um, doubles down on strengthening alliances and partnerships, uh, saying that the Naval Service will foster a global unity of effort to secure unfettered access to the maritime domain, a strong worldwide network of maritime partnerships united in common purpose, common purpose serves as an enduring advantage over our rivals. Furthermore, CNO's NAP plan published just last month, uh, states that our naval power is amplified by sailing and integrating with like-minded navies. We must continue to strengthen our alliances and partnerships to ensure our success across the continuum of day-to-day -day competition, crisis, and conflict. We must continue operating interchangeably with key allies to expand the reach and lethality of our collective forces across the globe. Our robust constellation of allies and partners remains a critical strategic advantage over our competitors. So uh, all that stuff doesn't just happen by itself. It takes it takes active engagement, cooperation, and really forcing the issue uh, uh, to ensure that uh, we can talk to each other on the radios, we can see each other's contacts on our on our platform, uh, and then and then really the that relationship piece, not just at the at the uh, at the upper echelon levels of government leadership. Of course, that's important. Um, but really, sometimes the the day to day relationships are also important for knowing who to call to get that last minute access to get that aircraft in for refueling and and the, and those things and and exercising those relationships and ensuring that we know how to uh, exercise the contacts and use that access that we have and use it regularly to ensure that it's always there for us. So within the national defense strategy, looking at a foreign air officer. It, a common question we receive is, you know, who are you? And so probably the um, number one key aspect of a foreign air officer, we're globally embedded. We are working inside the foreign uh, countries with our foreign partners and occasionally even embedded in their fleets, uh, riding on their ships, um, operating right alongside those naval partners. We're persistently forward. Two thirds of our billets are overseas. Majority of a FAO's career will be spent downrange, whether at a staff in an embassy or um, stationed with the foreign partner. Our job is foreign, it's always forward. And even those jobs that we do have that are back in CONUS, the mindset is still forward looking at still thinking about who our international partners are engaging with them and then also continuing to advance that national defense strategy. 
we're strategic operators. And so it, this really means that we're on the front lines of that great power competition within the framework of the national defense strategy. We're developing those desired strategic outcomes and then we're tying them to those tactical execution uh, engagements and um, events that are happening down at the more tactical level. And we're also, we're leaders but not in the typical sense that you see in the fleet. We're leading interagency teams. We're leading joint teams inside of embassies. We're leading multinational teams with our international partners. And this is all to advance Navy and joint force objectives. Next slide, please. When it comes to what we do, we everything that foreign air officers are doing is to advance the global objectives that are laid out in the national defense strategy and the CNOs building the allies and partners uh, line of effort. We do this in a couple of different ways. Um, one is assuring global access and posture in working overseas and assuring that our fleets have the um, access facing and overflight privileges that they need, working with our national, our international partners to make sure that this happens, respecting sovereign uh, sovereignty, but also being able to cooperate. The FAOs are the ones who are making all this happen so that our ships can move where they need to, the forces can move where they need to, and that we can move um, logistics uh, as, as required to achieve our mission objectives. Interoperability with our partners is also incredibly important. As Commander Myers has already mentioned, being able to talk on the same radios, being able to see each other, being able to coordinate different types of missions and, um, and preserve th those mission objectives, interoperability with our partners is incredibly important. This can be done uh, through foreign military sales, international military education and training. I'm sure that you see that you have uh, international students from other navies there at the Naval War College. Uh, this is important to help our international partners understand naval, U.S. naval um, operational planning. And then also doing that middle to middle cooperation to build familiarity between our navies. Uh, FAOs are also doing information and influence uh, type of operations. This can be done uh, human intelligence, strategic messaging, uh, strategic engagements and dialogue. Um, sometimes these can be at a, uh, a more operational level with military commanders. And sometimes it's uh, even at the secretarial or ministerial level. And this is all uh, in advance of combined lethality, because when we develop our allies and partners to be capable um, and willing partners, this advances both of our objectives. Next slide, please. And so then it comes down to how are we doing all of these different things? How are we achieving it? And it's through three main uh, lines of work. So it's security cooperation, human intelligence and influence operations, and then strategy plans and policy. Security cooperation can be done uh, via the fleet headquarters, combat command headquarters, uh, most often through our offices of defense cooperation or security cooperation. They go by different names in the embassy. And then, um, the defense attache service is um, that second line of work for human intelligence and influence operations. And then they are acting as the secretary of the Navy's uh, direct liaison, direct representative to that Naval fleet. And they keep important lines of communication open that are critical with both partners and, um, and, our, and our international hosts. With strategy plans and policy, this goes back to working towards that uh, national defense strategy objectives. And this can be done at Navy joint and interagency staffs like um, the State Department and um, uh, the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, sorry. <laughs> Next slide, please. So uh, this slide here goes into some real life examples of some of those things uh, Commander Fast was just talking about uh, along our three lines of work. So these are all things that our FAOs uh, have, were doing just, just last fall. Uh, so in Canada, for example, one of our FAO commanders uh, oversees a complex, of, a, a complex portfolio of 35 uh, foreign military sales programs uh, valued at $935 million. I, this has resulted directly into some into some upgrades like their uh, like their F A eighteen aircraft uh, for I F F mode five, uh, and then a uh, an option on their future fighter capability aircraft uh, up to twelve billion dollars uh, for twenty twenty five. So I mean that that kind of huge 
uh, impact uh, is, is both a big investment in our defense industry, but also builds up an ally, uh, their, their capability both to be stronger as a, as a partner for us and to work with us, uh, allow us to operate better with them. Uh, and then in Greece, uh, you can see uh, you can see Captain Ketter there in white uh, oversaw the, the first uh, visit between both the Greek Prime Minister and the U.S. Secretary of State to Naval Security Activity Suda Bay. It's really able to double down on the importance of that uh, facility as a as a as a location for as an access point for us for our ships and our aircraft uh, in that critical theater of operations. Uh, down in Cabo Verde, one of our uh, Africom uh, junior Africom FAOs, uh, Lieutenant Pan Commander Kane, uh, coordinated the diplomatic and logistic support for a, about a two-month uh, Coast Guard cutter deployment. Uh, it, it, as I'm sure you're aware, out in the fleet, we don't have uh, we don't have a huge number of service combatants that can regularly train with all of our allies and partners. But being able to work uh, with the Coast Guard and leverage one of those. Uh, ships to get in there and operate together with the Cabo Verde uh, Navy uh, really showed our commitment to them as a partner uh, in the face of GPC adversaries uh, operating in the region. All right, now, so now this, uh, we're going to drill down a little bit on the FAO community itself. So we are a very small communities, designator 1710. Uh, we're one of the smallest communities in the Navy, about 400 strong. Uh, will be growing to about 425 uh, by FY22. Uh, but still, this is uh, compared to other communities. Aviation, for example, has about 13,000 officers. Uh, SWO community has about 8,000 officers. Uh, so our 400 is is very small. But we are we are elite. We're highly trained. Uh, we're efficient and we're professional uh, in what we do. Uh, you can see the pie chart on the left. Five. Uh, we're we're assigned to one of five uh, AORs. They correspond to the geographic combatant commands. Uh, as Commander Fats mentioned, she's a CENTCOM FAO. I am an Indo-PACOM FAO. Um, and that's then also we have, of course, uh, Southcom, UCOM, and AFRICOM. So typically we do our training, both language and regionally focused master's degree, focuses around the assigned AOR. Uh, and we typically will spend, do most of our tours in the AOR, but do also sometimes go outside of the AOR. Uh, when, ne when, when needed um, by the community and when those opportunities av are available. So as small as we are um, and, and very closely aligned one for one billets to bodies, we, we're not always able to plug in an officer in, in their region. Sometimes they do have to go out of the region, but that, that can be, that can, those can be some good opportunities too. Um, so our billets, 402 uh, in, in FY21, as I said, growing to 425 by FY22. Range from 03 up to uh, up to the flag ranks. We're in 79 different countries. So Commander Fats mentioned those those three broad lines of work: attaché, SCO, uh, and then staff. So SCO, security cooperation, as you can see in the green pie chart. So those are those are usually in the embassies, uh, are located in the capitals, um, working uh, working this the foreign military sales portfolios and and, and often the the direct training uh, and 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 mill to mill engagement with uh, with the host nation attache service more of a rep representational role you can see them at about 15% of our billets and then other staff billets such as uh, fleet fleet staffs uh, and, and agency assignments um, OSD state department etc you can see that th how those are kind of um, spread out uh, pep you'll see that personnel exchange program i'm sure you're familiar with that uh, lindsay's going to talk about that a little bit more um, most of these are overseas. A lot of joint billets. We have no problems getting anybody uh, their, their their joint credit. Uh, we've got lots uh, lots and lots of joint. Um, and, and most of these do have training requirements. And often you will have to learn a second language uh, depending on your specific follow-on assignment beyond the one that you initially qualified in. So we're a pretty young and new community. We stood up only in 2006. First crop of new FAOs was was uh, 32, and we have grown steadily since uh, just hitting our FOC uh, of 400 just a couple of months ago. Uh, so we, we we've come a long way, but we will we still will take a lot of people in via lateral transfer on every board just to offset. Still have to grow about 20 people, so due to some recent growth, and then even just replacing the uh, retiring officers that we have. We still need to bring in around 15 officers per lateral transfer board. So uh, opportunities have not diminished to join the FAO community. If you're interested or you know somebody who is, just because we've reached uh, FOC now. 
So we mentioned that we have billets in 79 different countries. These are our embassy billets that are overseas. Uh, between SCO and Naval Attaché, we have roughly 130 billets um, all over the world, uh, divided up into our different regions. About 81 SCO and 49 Attaché billets. 95% of the Navy SCO billets are filled by FAOs. The only three that are not are um, we have one in Japan, one in Pakistan, and one in Jamaica that are filled by non-1710s. And then about 50% of our attache billets are coded for 1710, and the others are um, a myriad between 1310, uh, 1000 coded, and, and what have you. Two of our attache billets are considered flying FAO billets, and those are opportunities for um, prior 1310s who are still in good standing to um, to fly the C-12 that's on station, but Commander Myers will mention that in a little more detail. Next slide, please. When it comes to our staff billets, definitely a more concentration in the U.S., but still worldwide uh, between the different um, naval component commands and the fleet headquarters. We also have seven PEP assignments. There's roughly 80 PEP uh, billets in the Navy, seven of which are coded for 1710. Most of these are uh, English instructors at our foreign naval academies. And these in our foreign war colleges are great opportunities for our junior FAOs specifically, because one, they offer that opportunity to get your in-region experience, but also because uh, out of foreign war college or out of PEP assignment, it gives you the opportunity to really create those relationships with um, your international partner at a more junior level so that as you both grow and mature and promote in your own service, you still have those relationships to be able to have those lines of communication and work with each other. For example, you know, in Chile, if you go to the war college there, and then we have um, an 04 and a milestone 05 billet at the embassy, and then also the SDO DAT is filled by a 1710. So there's this opportunity to develop these relationships early on in your career and be able to carry those as you promote and become more senior. Next slide, please. Okay, so, so how to join. If you're interested uh, in making, uh, learning more about this possible career transition, uh, you do have to have a minimum of five years commission service or one of the very few communities that has such a late uh, entry point. Um, so of course, anyone in this crowd, anyone at the War College probably is, you're all Lieutenant Commanders for a uh, vast majority. So uh, so that's not an issue. Um, so really it's, uh, it's uh, open to lateral transfer anywhere between five up to, uh, really up to 15, 20 years of service. I mean, you could, you could lateral transfer as a commander if you've, if you've got uh, that senior, if you've got um, some of the most of the qualification items already under your belt and you've got a strong operational uh, record. So first and foremost, we're looking for uh, we're looking for warfare qualified um, officers with a, a record of sustained superior performance. We're not it is it is highly competitive to get into the FAO community. So we're not uh, we're not taking the washouts from other communities We're we're taking those people who are just looking to uh, do something different, feel like perhaps this line of work is more suitable uh, with their interests. Um, so the lateral transfer board happens uh, every six months uh, here in Millington, basically where every uh, everybody in every community who's looking to change designators uh, applies and then, and then uh, can be selected uh, depending on the number of quotas available. Uh, so as I mentioned, state spirit performance, warfare qualified, uh, your GPA, uh, your GPA matters because uh, both both to show that your your academic aptitude in general uh, and as a as a usually a good indicator for your writing and communication skills and your uh, your work ethic. Uh, so that is important. Um, but for those of you already getting your master's degree there, it's you know that that's that you're going to have that under your belt. So I'm sure that's not too much of an issue for you. Um, the D-Lab is, is, is a, an aptitude test that you're required to take uh, before you apply for lateral transfer. Uh, and this is a test which, uh, which measures your ability to, your ability to learn a foreign language. It, it, it basically makes up, it invents a language, uh, teaches you the rules to that language, and then, and then plays you some passages and, and asks you to identify some patterns. So it's, it's pretty effective at identifying whether you're going to struggle in learning a foreign language or not. So a lot of people uh, already uh, apply, already having a foreign language under their belt, and that's great. 
uh, that shows that you've learned to learn that language, but very often you will, will, will need you to learn another language for a different assignment, or we may need, need to assign you to a different AOR. Uh, so that's why the DLAB is still uh, important and, and required. So you can generally take that at any kind of DOD testing facility. It's not a Navy specific test uh, and that score never expires. Um, so uh, a 110 is the minimum, um, but uh, higher is, is better just to just to demonstrate that you're not going to have any issues learning a foreign language. Uh, so the FAO community certainly values people with overseas experience already. Uh, perhaps maybe you've done a staff tour, Seventh Fleet, Sixth Fleet, et cetera, something like that. Uh, that's valued. Even just an overseas assignment like a Yokosuka based ship or squadron, uh, you can get some good overseas experience well that will that will help um, prepare you for the FAO community. As I mentioned, if you have a foreign language already, that's great. If you don't, it's not necessarily required. Um, we, we will teach you uh, a language, the language that, that you need to know. So it's fine if you don't have one. Um, and then, you know, having a regionally focused graduate education, particularly if you graduate from the, um, the um, National Security Studies program there at Naval War College, which, which, which most people out there are probably, that's what you're enrolled in. Um, that, that will generally meet your regionally focused master's degree requirement. Um, so that, that gets you, gets you ahead and, and able to get you fully qualified and employed out in the fleet sooner as a foreign area officer. So um, it, it, it definitely everybody has a very different path into the, into the FAO community and, and really it can be viable um, at, at a lot of different times in your career. So it, everybody's an individual case. So really encourage you to reach out uh, to me or Commander Fats um, offline later with your specific situation if you're interested. Um, and, and we can talk through what kind of what your timeline would look like, what your qualification path would look like, how viable you might may or may not be for continued promotion in the FAO community, uh, and happy to talk through that because it's almost always a, a case by case individual basis. So talking about the specific training pipeline, it really is a bespoke process because while there are three main qualification requirements uh, set by the DOD for joint FAOs, that being the regionally focused political military master's degree, uh, language proficiency, a two, two or above and two of the three modalities and one year of in theater duty experience, every FAO brings a little something different to the table. Some are a clean slate and we refer to them as a full build FAO. I need to take you from um, having no qualification requirements to full qualification. And the timeline for that, depending on your region, could be 18 months or could be as long as four years uh, for some of our regions. And so we're just gonna, my priority as the junior detailer is really looking at how we're going to get you to full qualification uh, in the most expedient but complete um, manner. And so if you're a student at the Naval War College, that's fantastic because you've got that master's complete, but maybe maybe you're a student there and you're getting a master's in operational research. That does not fit the requirement. And so we're gonna talk about, okay, what are the other options? You're still eligible to lat transfer. We're still gonna get you trained and get you the requirements, but maybe it's gonna look a little different. Maybe we're gonna do a foreign war college because then we're gonna get you that language, send you to the war college um, with your international partners, which is gonna dual count as both a one year of in theater experience, as well as um, that regionally focused degree. So a lot of different ways. Um, a lot of our officers do go through the Naval Postgraduate School. We have two uh, new FAOs who are students at the Naval War College. And then um, some of our officers do pull mill masters or did Olmstead while they are URL. And so we're able to use those uh, degrees to meet the requirements. Most languages are taught at DLI in uh, Monterey, but the lower density languages are taught there in Washington, DC. And then we occasionally have heritage speakers that we're able to um, match up with the region and um, maximize that. However, um, sometimes we'll get officers and they may bring a heritage language uh, for a region that there's not a need in their year group, but they have a high D-Lab or they have other experience that makes them better suited for another AOR. And so we'll have that conversation and we get them fully trained. Uh, like Commander Myers said, sometimes our FAOs will learn um, one, two, three languages depending on the billet and where we need them and, and their uh, aptitude to be able to do that. 
following graduate and uh, language education, then our FAOs can expect to do their first tour uh, in region to get that in theater duty experience. This can be in a PEP assignment. Uh, it could be at a form war college. It could be at a um, perhaps a staff if uh, sixth fleet or fifth fleet or seventh fleet. And then some of our FAOs will go direct to the embassies to do security cooperation. So it really is a little bit of a different path for every FAO based on both their background and the region they're assigned. Next slide, please. So this is a um, slide that depicts the nominal FAO career path. And really it begins with the source community. We, as Commander Myers mentioned, we are lateral transfer only. That can start as early as five years commission service, but it can extend. Uh, if you were an Olmstead scholar or you went to, we have uh, FAOs who are later accessions and did a foreign war college with their um, parent community. So they're bringing over all of those skills skills, all of those qualification requirements and, and a lot of great experience. So we do see FAOs that come in at that 10, 12, 14 year mark, and they really aren't disadvantaged. Uh, our board analysis shows that despite when you come into the community, as long as you're getting qualified and you have that record of sustained superior performance, that is really what's going to matter most. Then as a FAO, uh, again, it, just like everything else, it's all a little bit different and it, that really depends on your region. And then the timing. Um, typically we'll see a, uh, a staff tour or a SCO tour and we try to, we try to um, mix those up as much as possible, but the region dynamics will impact that. But big things that we're looking for is getting, um, you know, those competitive breakouts, whether as a, a in a group of um, peers, or you know, even against your reporting seniors' cumulative average, um, our folks in Southcom, uh, Africom, and UCOM, if they're serving in a SCO tour on the continent, uh, they are all considered one pool. So those are actually still competitive assignments for those FAOs. So. Um, uh, just a lot of different options as you go through um, trying to get to those attache assignments. Our milestone board is after the 05 selection board. And then at that point, you can see that you can still expect to do different types of training. And that training can include um, uh, JPME2. It can include the Joint Military Attaché School, which is about 12 weeks. Um, if you're going to a SCO billet, you can expect to spend about five weeks at Wright Pat Air Force Base at DSC uh, University. Um, and occasionally you're gonna get one, two more languages. Additionally, FAOs are offered resources to be able to maintain their language. And occasionally they're able to get um, enhancement or sustainment training uh, in between their different tours. Next slide, please. All right, talk a little bit about money. Uh, those uh, aviators or submariners in the group, uh, you're probably enjoying your flight pay or your sub pay. We got that too, uh, up to $1,000 per month for foreign language proficiency bonus. Uh, is uh, is pretty uh, is a pretty welcome boost to the paycheck. Also, things like CPA. My last tour on Seventh Fleet staff. I, I think the whole two years we were underway about a month, but I collected CPA the whole time, about four hundred bucks a month. So that's that's a nice boost as well. Uh, of course, hazardous duty incentive pay, imminent danger pay, uh, depending on the specific location. Uh, for uh, those flying attaché billets, uh, for the aviators uh, in the crowd that uh, you, of course, you'll get uh, flight pay when you're in those, uh, when you're in those billets, but not all the time like aviators get uh, now. Um, and then COLA is not, uh, is, is no joke. That is a pretty significant uh, boost to your paycheck as well. It, it's, it's typically calculated to truly capture those additional costs you have for being overseas. And generally, uh, I always felt a lot more uh, wealthy uh, with living overseas than I do back in the States uh, here in Tennessee, where I no longer get that, that COLA. It felt like a pretty big uh, drop in the paycheck. And then of course, a lot of tax relocations too, uh, which can be nice. Um, okay, so aviation, Naval Aviation Qualified FAO. So of the 400 of us SAOs, there's about 50 of us uh, who, who have this designation. Uh, you have to come from, the, from 1310 Aviator, um, and what it, it and what it means is, and you, you can't uh, you can't have vol termed or uh, you know, given up your wings or anything like that. You've got to you got to be in good standing with the aviation community when you leave. 
Uh, and then once you are aeronautically designated, you're eligible for our aviation uh, FAO billets. Those are 1712 coded billets. Uh, but also there's um, 17, there's um, pilot designated uh, uh, flying attache billets as well. So th there's 13 total uh, naval flying attache billets ranging in rank from 04 to 06. Uh, two of them are coded for FAO, but that's just that's just a uh, that's just a Manning um, coding. We the reality is is that we we fill each other's billets between FAO and aviation all the time. Um, I think about a year ago we didn't they were filling all of ours and we were filling um, two or three of theirs. So it just kind of those those opportunities are out there. Uh, the only catch is you have to uh, you have to do it. Uh, you can't be out of the cockpit for more than ten years, uh, or you, you turn into a pumpkin. So I just keep that in mind as you pick your uh, as you pick your your choices. So uh, you're a naval attaché um, is your primary duty, but you but they have C-12s on station as uh, as Lin Lindsay mentioned, uh, which you will fly to maintain your uh, maintain your NATOPS, uh, and then it's also it's flown as part of your mission uh, in, in some cases to to get get you or other people. Uh, that you need to access to different parts of the country and different people, and so there's there's some good uh, there's some good uh, payoff for doing those. Okay, so that is our last uh, that is our last prepared slide. Uh, I'm going to take this uh, slide down in a minute, um, but uh, do make a note uh, if you're interested. And in, we have time for Q and A, and and have, we'll definitely take anyone's questions. Um, but if you want to talk about your specific situation and whether or not um, th there might be a path for you, or if you just have more questions in general, uh, please uh, take note of our phone numbers and email addresses and feel free to reach us, reach out uh, later uh, to have a, a more direct conversation. You're, you're welcome to just cold call me. Uh, that number rings through to my cell phone when I'm telework teleworking. I'd be happy to talk. Um, so I'll take this down in a moment. Um, but before we go into Q&A, um, I, I just want to make a couple of introductions uh, of folks on the call. So, uh, first of all, Commander Greg Adams uh, is uh, is there on the Naval War College staff. He's an operational planner in international programs, and uh, there he is. Hi, Greg. So um, he, um, all right. So he, uh, so Greg is uh, an Indo-PACOM FAO like me, but but we, we, it's such a such a diverse. Even someone from the same region. I mean, he was at CTF seventy three. Uh, doing great things there in Singapore, and then I uh, just came from uh, at attaché duty in Indonesia, and then on to um, he went out of region after that over to um, Naples on our on our staff there. So that that's a good example of someone going outside the region. But he's there, a great uh, a real a real uh, superstar FAO, and and is a great person to kind of ask uh, to get with offline too and ask questions. Uh, and then I think our, uh, as uh, Lindsay mentioned, two student FAOs going through the curriculum there um, that you could kind of talk to. They don't they don't exactly have uh, experience as FAO out in the field yet, but at least they have recently navigated the treacherous path of the lateral transfer board, and so they can give you some tips for how you get released from your community and and and, and find your way through the board. So that's Lieutenant Commander Mohammed Furkan. Uh, and then Lieutenant Commander Warren Brooks. I, so I think I see both of them on this call. So I just wanted to point them out um, so uh, you can connect with any of those gents uh, offline. But I will stop there and uh, turn it and we'll open it up for questions. And then uh, Laura, whenever we're out of time and you need to shut us off, just go ahead and, uh, and, and end the call. Thank you.